preach and teach you the Word of God the last few Sundays. And uh, we kicked off Salt and Light after second service last Sunday after preaching through and teaching through talk it pers- uh, Take It Personally and Talk It Personally. Man. Well, here we are with missions on Sunday. And think of this real quick. Uh, as we uh, started something like this, this first, uh, the first of the year in uh, January included a fifth Sunday, we had uh, Pastor Randy preach to us and uh, bring in uh, for us an incredible and uh, tremendous recognition of all the missionaries that we support and a little report on each one of them. And it was in, in light of uncommon, our uh, faithful men and their spouses that served the Lord in the mission field. And so that was missions on Sunday number one. And then Pastor Bobby came and preached to us uh, back in May and uh, delivered truly a great challenge for us about what missions in our lives ought to be taken from the place of personal life and, and what God had done in his life and what continues what God continues to do in his life to have a, uh, a passion for souls, to have a heart for the souls. And we had all kinds of New Testaments out here. And uh, a lot of people picked some New Testaments up, little red books, and we're working toward and through that whole idea of not thinking about ourselves so much as thinking about the souls that are all around us every single day. So here we are, missions on Sunday number three. And today, uh, Pastor Brian is going to speak, but he's going to be missionary Brian Calloway as um, we listen to and have God challenges through his voice on being in the mission and how important it is for every one of us, again, to see our personal responsibility tied together to the international mission work that God called him to do, along with Tammy and, of course, Titus. It is hard to believe that a number of years back, six years ago, six, seven, oh my goodness, almost seven, isn't it, that we ordained you, and then a couple years later sent you out and and uh, gosh, it was the fall of 2016 that you and your family were right up here and we were praying over you to go to Zambia, Africa. So this morning, missions on Sunday, uh, Pastor Brian, come and preach to us and teach us the word of God. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Give me a hug in. Oh Amen. gosh, this is great. <laughs> a Amen. A yeah, a little one. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, family. If you have your yellow books, go ahead and get the, oh, no, that was last week. Sorry, I got that. That was, that was last week and three weeks before. Amen. Um, no, once again, it's, uh, it's, it's an honor to be able to be up here, to be able to share with you God's word. It always is. Um, you can see up there, if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and go on over to Acts chapter 11. It'll be a bit before we get there, but, um, you know, this really dovetails on what we've spoken about the last four weeks, um, about take it personally. And um, because everything we just talked about for four, about, 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 sorry. <laughs> when I was singing, I was like, there's something wrong with my voice. And, and it's now it's manifesting up here. All right. So um, I'll do my best not to let it keep cracking, right? So, but the past four weeks have really been about we, talk, we talked about taking it personally, and we talked about, <coughs> excuse me, um, the uh, Great Commission. But really, when you break it down to what it is, it's missions is what we preached on for four weeks, really. Because that's what missions is about. It's about evangelism. It's about reaching people. There's so many different directions, ways you can go to with this. Um, and I love how God worked it all out. Again, like I've said so many times, he's the greatest orchestrator there ever is, um, because we couldn't plan a lot of this. God does it, right? And so, you know, I hope and pray that you've taken that book from the past four weeks and you've gone through it a little bit and just looked at it. I've gone back through some of it a bit, and I know Justin, you and I were talking about it that last day, just about uh, the book and what it all entailed, what was in there. Um, but, you know, I went back through and I was looking at that, those last four points, and those last four points, it talked about, um, what did it talk about? See, it's right there, I know. That motivation, being motivated for God's word. And, and there's four points that we talked about being motivated, if you remember. And the first one was talking about the love of Christ. You remember that, 
God's alleyway with those bumpers on the side, you know, and, and to keep those bumpers up so that it'll keep us on the alley. Because when we put those bumpers down, that love of Christ, sometimes we find ourselves in the gutter, right? And so we have to make sure and allow God, God's love to constrain us and keep us where he wants us to be. And then we talked about also Luke chapter 16. Remember in that passage, it really gave us a reality of eternity when you look at the life of that rich man and Lazarus and where the rich man is this very day. He's still where he was back then. And so that should keep in our minds a mindset of reality of eternity. Um, and then from there, it moved over to having compassion for people. You know, we talked about consider the source. Consider where lost men and women are coming from. They don't know any different. They're lost. The reason they act the way they do is because they're bound by sin. They don't know any different. That doesn't excuse it but yet it should give us some compassion for them because they are sheep without a shepherd, right? And they need a shepherd, the great shepherd, Jesus Christ. Um, and so that compassion should help us maintain a motivation because we were once where they're at now, right? And then that last piece, we talked about the judgment seat of Christ, where we're going we're gonna to go from standing to kneeling to casting those crowns. And depending on how we live our life after salvation is going to depend on how much we have to cast back to him. And so all of these pieces here really flow into the place of mission and missions, you know. You know, like Brownie, Brownie was saying, I'm kind of speaking from a place <clears throat> of a missionary this morning. You know, when you look at Ephesians chapter 4, we're actually going to be there, but not to this passage where the Bible says, and he gave some, apost uh, some evangelists, some pastors, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists and teachers, of pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, the work of the ministry, and the edifying of the body of Christ. See, that word apostle is really today's missionary. And that's what a, a missionary is there for, is to perfect the saints, to equip the church, to equip, to edify, and educate. And that's where I'm kind of a position from today, is just wanting to challenge and encourage you in this place of what we call mission slash missions, right? And so... This four weeks is that we've talked about is just one aspect of what missions is, but it's a very important one. And, and having the opportunity to be a missionary on the foreign field, which was a dream come true that God allowed me, now he's allowing me the opportunity to encourage you to see the mission where you live in right now and take advantage of it in that moment to be able to make a difference for his kingdom. And so there was a... a uh, a phrase that God gave me through this study, and I didn't use this last week at all, but this phrase that he's given me is connected to missions, and that phrase is, mission should be a biblical constant, a biblical constant, and I hope you understand what I mean by that. Something that's constant, that never stops, it just continues. See, this mission that God has placed us into, this mission should never be broken. It should never be disrupted. Our life should be continual within the mission. Now, oftentimes, individually, we break it. We disrupt it because of our hearts, our attitudes, whatever it might be, our willingness, our unwillingness. But I can tell you this. It may be broken in our lives because of our decisions at times. But let me tell you, around the world, the mission is constant. It never stops. It doesn't. Ever since Jesus Christ rose from the grave, his word's been going and moving he is moving. He is moving. He's alive. We just sang about it. Amen? And right now, as we speak, somewhere around the world, I really believe is sharing with somebody the gospel of Jesus Christ. Somewhere around the world, as we speak right now, someone is bowing the knee to receive Christ as their personal Savior. That's the biblical constant that I'm talking about. And that's what we should be working towards, to live this constant life of this biblical attitude of missions. So we break it down to this, what is mission and what is missions? I may have shared this before, or you may have heard it from a class that you've taken on mission, but it's always good to know what we're trying to accomplish, what God has called us to do. So here's a definition of mission. Mission is God's desire to restore his lost image in lost man. That's the, that's the mission. So for thousands of years now, that's what God has been working on, and from foreknowledge, um, from time past, the eons past, his foreknowledge of knowing what was going to take place, he had already ordained that the lamb was going to be slain, right? 
from the foundations of the earth that was ordained. He knew what was going to happen. His righteousness will prevail. Oh, and thank you so very, very much. Wow. You know what? And I've got to take a drink now. Thank you. <clears throat> and so with that, that foreknowledge is telling us that Jesus Christ was going to die on the cross and he was going to raise again. And this whole process God put in play in order to see us get back to the place where he wanted us to be. And that is God's image inside of us. That's his lost image in lost man. So that's the definition of mission. So what is missions? Missions is the process by which we accomplish the mission. It's, it's the way that we accomplish God's purpose. And it's through the means of, believe it or not, discipleship. That's where missions is effective in the mission. Because if you think about it, we don't just go and lead people to Christ, but we teach them to go out and do the same. Then we train them up to go out and lead people to Christ, disciple them, um, to reproduce themselves, to reach the world, to plant churches, to send missionaries to accomplish the mission. Mission is, missions is just the means by which we accomplish that. So missions is always connected to discipleship. It's always connected with reproduction. So you might be asking yourself, are you involved in the mission? Are you involved in missions? Is your life right now somehow, some way involved in reproducing who you are? I hope you're asking yourself that question. But you have to understand where mission begins. Mission begins at what we've been talking about for the past four weeks. It begins at salvation. That's where it begins. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 says this. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. So how does salvation fit into this? I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech that you walk worthy of that vocation wherewith ye are called. So we have to define some terms here. We have to define some biblical terms because when we think of vocation, we think of the way we work and, and what we might be doing in order to provide for our families. But that's not what this means. This word means in vocation. In the Bible, vocation means this. It is a divine invitation to a place of salvation. So now put your mind in this. We're to walk worthy of our salvation. You know, your salvation costs a lot. A lot. It cost the Father his own Son. Pure, perfect, righteous blood. That's what it costs to save your soul. So what we're trying to learn here is that we are to walk worthy in that. We're not to let it go. We're not to take it for granted. Within this salvation that God gives us, this is where mission begins. And this is how missions continues. It begins and continues through your salvation. So now we've defined vocation. What does walking worthy mean? See, when you look at this salvation piece, this salvation comes with a huge responsibility. Huge responsibility. And where it starts is our responsibility is found in walking worthy. We have to walk worthy before God before we can walk worthy before the church, before we can walk worthy out in the world. So where do we stand before God? What does that walk worthy mean? Here's what it means. When you break it down, walk just means forward progress. Are you making forward progress? Are you moving and growing in your life with Jesus Christ? But the word worthy means here in a godly way, in a godly manner. So now put all that together. Are you, do you have forward progress in your life that is filled with godliness? When you're walking forward and you have that progress in your life and it is in a godly manner, you're walking worthy of the salvation that the Lord has given unto you for your soul. See, that's a lot to say. But I hope and pray that when I say walk worthy, when you see that phrase here and there this morning, you're going to think about your godly walk. Are you worthy? Are you walking worthy? And the only reason you could is because of what Jesus Christ did in and through your life. It's not anything that you've done yourself. It's all through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That is the reason why we are worthy. So walk in forward progress in a godly manner. You know, three times this phrase is mentioned in Paul's epistles. Ephesians 4.1, we just talked about it, walk worthy of the vocation. Colossians 1.10, walk worthy of the Lord. 
And then 1 Thessalonians 2.12, it says, walk worthy of God. So now think about that. Walk in godliness towards the Lord, but walk in godliness in your salvation. See, two are connected to God himself, to the Lord and to God. It's connected to him. Are you walking worthy towards the Lord? Are you walking worthy in the Lord, of the Lord? See, they're connected to him. But the other one is connected to that vocation, which is connected to salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith. See, what God wants us to walk worthy of, he wants us to walk worthy of the person of God and of the grace of God. That's where we walk worthy in. And we always have to be evaluating our lives to find out where we stand before a true living God. Are we walking worthy? Do we have forward progress in this godly manner? That's what we have to look at. Godly forward progress, that walking worthy in the person of God and and in the grace of God with an anticipated outcome. That anticipated outcome is mission and missions. That's where we have to be focused. That's where we have to be living. So now with that, look at Acts chapter 11. We're going to read the the last part of Acts 11 and the last part of Acts 12, but I'm going to give you some backstory on this. Acts chapter 11 is really where we see the Gentile church being formed, really where it's talked about. This is where they're called Christians first, right? Now, before this, it was all Jewish people that were getting saved. And slowly through this transition, you see Gentiles starting to get saved. Well, this is kind of alarming the leadership in Jerusalem. So they start hearing about something's taking place in Antioch. So they send a man by the name of Barnabas down to Antioch to check out what's going on. And he gets so excited, he sees a revival taking place, Gentiles getting saved. And so what he does is he starts to exhort them to cleave to God with their hearts, just to stay close to him. But as a good disciple maker does, his thought is, I want my disciple to be a part of this ministry. If you're a disciple maker and you see something that is God is moving, you see where God is at and you're joining him in his work, the first person you should be going to get is your disciple to work with you in this ministry. So the first thing he does is he runs to Tarsus. He goes back to Tarsus to get Paul the apostle, which is Saul at this time. And then he brings him, he brings him to Antioch. And for one year, they're sitting there ministering the word of God to everybody there that are in Antioch, right? So now look at this. Look what happens at the end of Acts chapter 11, verse 27. It says, and in the days, in the days of I'm sorry, in the days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul." So I think you see the story here. Jerusalem and in all Judea, there's a, there's a famine. So what they do is they get a disciple maker and a disciple. They put them together. Everybody comes together. They get care packages, these, these care packages together, and they send them to Jerusalem by the hands of Paul and Barnabas to help them. But then if you look at the end of Acts chapter 12, much happens in Acts 12. But then this ministry comes to an end. In Acts chapter 12, verse 24 and 25, it says, But the word of God grew and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get into what God's going to teach us. Father God, we love you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for these passages that really teach us about missions and how constant it ought to be. Lord, I pray for this congregation today that they're already challenging themselves through Scripture and that the Spirit of God is pricking their heart, showing them where they stand right now before a holy God and the adjustments that we all need to make in order to continue that progress of godliness, Lord. We love you and praise you. If, if someone is here is lost today, Lord, their life begins at the cross, and I ask and pray you would prick them, get them to a place to where they will finally submit, bow the knee, and receive you as Savior. For the rest of us, Lord God, Help us to maintain a thought process that will help us to grow in the mission you've given us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as you see up here, our first point that we're talking about, this constant will not be broken. 
This constant emissions will not be broken if we walk worthy with biblical effectiveness. How effective are you? How effective are you in your life? It could be your family. It could be uh, ministry. It could be where you work. But how, I mean, think about how effective you are. And I really believe that through, as God was showing me this, you can only be as effective as well-prepared you are and how willing you are to be obedient. You see, you can't really be effective if you're not prepared and if you're not willing to do what God has asked you to do. Acts 12, 24 says, but the word of God grew and multiplied. See, overall, our priority and mission and missions is to see the word of God grow, to see it multiply. That should be our priority in individuals' lives, in churches' lives, and around the world, even to see the lost come to this place. And where biblical preparation and obedience are found, there's going to be natural growth. There's going to be natural multiplication. We're going to see naturally, when you have preparation and obedience, you're going to see people come to know Christ. You're going to see them grow. You're going to see them mature. And this is through that missions process of discipleship. But we have to ask ourselves, are we prepared? You know, this isn't going to take place within a church it's not going to take place with any individual if you're not prepared and if you're not willing to obey. Those two go hand in hand. They're on the same coin. So what is preparation? It's just simply this, to make ready. Are you ready? Are you ready right now? If God's speaking to you right now and he said, I want you to go, I want you to do this. I'm calling you to a place of a pastor. I'm calling you to a place of a, a missionary. I'm calling you to go across the street. Have you prepared yourself enough to be able to say yes? Or do you have to say, no, Lord, I'm not ready. I have not prepared myself. See, preparations are the road to maturity and multiplication. That's what God uses in order to see God's word grow and multiply around the world. It takes that forward progression, that walking worthy with preparation at hand. Growth and multiplication will not happen if you don't have a heart for missions. See, do we have a heart for missions? We just spent four weeks talking about sharing the gospel with, with the lost world, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with those around, and, and making it simple in a manner to where it's simple as breaking down just to inviting people to a inviting people to a, 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 an event here at our church and inviting people to our church using a handout, eventually praying that those spiritual conversations will change to a place of salvation. That's how simple it is. It's not intimidating at all, I promise you. We've spent four weeks talking about this. But if you don't have a heart for missions, all of that can be for naught. Barnabas and Saul, they were sent to Jerusalem to take relief. They had a heart to see change in the life of people, the body of Christ. And I have no doubt that the word of God was being preached unto the lost. They were obedient to what God had called them to do. But in order to be obedient, they were already prepared. They were prepared in every aspect of their life. Physically, they were ready to walk all that way. They didn't have planes and buses and, 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 and what do you call the, those boards you can ride on and you know, I can't think of the name right now, but they just fly everywhere. Hoverboards, yeah, they didn't have all that stuff. They had to walk. They had donkeys. They, they had different ways and means, but their number one transport was feet. So they had to walk. They were physically fit. They were physically ready to go. Emotionally, their minds and hearts were where it needed to be. Spiritually, they knew the word of God. They knew what God was doing. They were ready. Financially, they were taken care of. They were able to make the trip. They were ready through their pre preparations. So when we look at this, look at 2 Timothy 2.2. 2, it's right up here. We use this verse so much when it comes to discipleship. And the things that thou hast heard among many witnesses, the same commit thou unto faithful men who should be able to teach others also. Right? That's the verse. And we use it for discipleship, and rightly so, because it's talking about multiplication. But if you look at these four generations that I just mentioned, it's also about missions. You see, it's about God working in you, you working in somebody else, and then them going out and doing the same. But when you look at this word that we're emphasizing here, it's the word commit. All that word means is giving yourself, giving of yourself. Are you willing to give of yourself to God? 
Are you willing to trust him with your life, with your family, with your finances, with your emotions, with, your, um, uh, with your, how, how you are physically? Are you willing to trust him? Are you willing to prepare? Are you going to commit your life to him? Because and until we commit our life to God, it's going to be difficult to commit our life to anybody else, really. We might do it in a worldly manner. It happens all the time. But we're, we're, we're reaching and coming from a place of spirituality here, not worldly. So I'm looking at it from, if you're not willing to commit to God, are you, gonna, you won't, probably won't be willing to commit to people. See, that effectiveness that we're talking about, effective means successful in an intended result. They were successful because their intended result was to take packages to help them, but also at the same time, it was to see God's word grow and multiply and people get saved. See, when they took that relief, the relief was good. It was good. It's always good to be able to help somebody physically. See, that was the entrance that God gave them, that entrance of charity, that love and action. By going and taking a care package, that showed the people that we here at Antioch, we love you and we're going to help you. We're going to be a part of your lives, Right? That's charity, love and action. If they just said it and sent a memo, a telegram, however that might work, that wouldn't have been as powerful. But it says here the multiple, at the same time, the relief was good, but the multiplication was better. The multiplication of God's word was better because that was continuance in charity. See, they entered in with that charity, but they continued there. They didn't just provide the physical without staying for the spiritual. Does that... Remind you of anything that we do here at First Bible Baptist. It's called ADP Sports, right? We provide something physical up on those fields. Now, it's not a need. There might be some who are fanatics that look at it as a need, but it's not a need. It is a luxury. It is an opportunity. We live in a society that people love sports, and God has moved us as a church to reach people in that manner. So there's something physically taking place up there, but that doesn't all matter if we don't stay for the spiritual. We have to stay for the spiritual. We have to be willing to get involved in people's lives. That's the way we're going to be effective. We don't worry about being effective physically. Our goal and plan is to be effective spiritually, and it's going to take through personal uh, preparation. You know, my preparations to get on the field took about 17 years. 17 years of getting saved in this church, going through discipleship, going through some growth, going through some shepherd school teaching. I could break it down for you, but I don't have the time to do so. But I remember right where I was when God called me into the ministry. He said, Brian, do you want my best? I said, yes. He said, okay, well, there's nothing else I want you to do but serve me. I remember right where I was when he called me and said, I want you to be a missionary. Okay, Lord, I'll do it. But I remember right where I was when he called me and said, oh, you're not going to El Salvador, you're going to Zambia, Africa. I remember right where I was. It didn't happen overnight. It was 17 years of preparation. But here's the thing. It would have been for nothing if I didn't obey. All that preparation wouldn't have been a thing if I did not say yes to the Lord. Then it took me another four years in Zambia to prepare ourselves to be here on staff at First Bible. You know, Tammy and I, we talk all the time. We make jokes all the time how God took us all the way to Africa to prepare us for America. And boy, is that not true. It really is true. There's a lot of things happening over there that we're experiencing here. We're like, yep, we're ready for that, you know. So God has prepared us here. Four more years of preparation over there in order to be here. See, the Word of God was already in Zambia when I got there. God used us to help bring health and maturity to an already existing ministry. We didn't take anything new there. But let me tell you, the Word of God in Zambia right now, it is still growing. It is still multiplying. You see, it's not because of me. It's not because of Bobby. It's because of God. But he had some willing vessels to say, yes, here I am, send me. And because of that, he worked in and through those vessels in order to multiply and for the word of God to grow. And it's still happening now. See, Tammy and I, we were just the final piece to the puzzle. And, and God is still moving it. And now we've just been put back into our, Bible, our, our, our body here. And we fit. And God has fit us here. And it's a beautiful thing. And I'm excited about what he's doing. See, the leadership of First Bible Baptist and the body of Christ prepared Tammy and I to go. 
then we obey. Then the Spirit of God continued through them over there to prepare us to come back, and then we obeyed. And I'm not saying all this to, to lift us up on any pedestal. By all means, I made my, my many mistakes on this journey. But I'm just sharing with you that that's walking worthy is something that I had to constantly look in my life. And am I walking in a godly manner? Have I prepared my life to do and to obey? Your effectiveness in the mission will depend on your preparations while in the ministry. That's how you're going to be effective. So the first point of application is this. Preparations are pointless without obedience. There is no reason to prepare if you've already decided you're not going to do anything with it. There are many that come to the church that are not preparing. And, and we pray for you and we, we encourage, we ask God to convict you so that you would put yourself in a position to prepare. But if you're not going to, to be obedient with it, there's no reason to prepare. Walking worthy must be done through obedience. Amen? The second point here is this mission constant will not be broken if we walk worthy with biblical efficiency. Are we efficient with what God has called us to do? Are we efficient in how he's put us together? See, it takes two things. It takes ownership and it takes teamwork in this what we call the mission. It's not going to be done properly if we don't take ownership and if we don't work as a team. Acts 12.25 says they fulfilled their ministry. It doesn't say he. It says they. They were a team that fulfilled what God wanted them to do. They were efficient, and there was efficiency in this. Now, for, and we don't find the word efficiency in the Bible, but we do find a word that is connected to that. In 1 Thessalonians 2.13, it says, For this cause, also thank God, thank we God without ceasing, because when we received the word of God, which he heard of us, he received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. That word effectually is also efficient. It means efficiently. See, right here it's connecting the truth. It's connecting the word of God. And that is what efficiently works inside of you. So when you have the word of God working inside of you, well, the last I checked, the word of God, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, right? And the word was manifest in the flesh. And we have the, the word right here on, on paper. This is the word of God that we read. And the Godhead is working in the midst of that. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Father gives us vision to fulfill the mission. He shows us where we're supposed to go and do, right? God the Spirit gives us, or I'm sorry, God the Son gives us intimacy. We get into the word of God and he guides and directs us and shows us what decisions we need to make. And he confirms through scripture. But then he does, he gives us peace through the Spirit, God the Spirit, so we know that we're making the right decisions. You see, this is how Godhead is working in teamwork with you to make the right decisions for the mission. God's Word is efficiently working. We work together with God, and when you work to we together with God, I promise you much more is going to get accomplished, more than you could ever do on your own. But then it says in Ephesians 4.16, we see another word, the same word effectually, but it's connected to the body of Christ. It says, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. There's a lot here. And you may have mentioned or, or, or heard me mention the last few weeks about this verse. I hadn't quoted it till now. But the two words that always stand out to me is fitly and supplieth. See, if you are a member of First Bible Baptist Church, if you are a member of another Bible teaching and preaching church or the church you're at, you fit there. God has fit you in there like a puzzle piece. You fit perfectly there. And then the gifts and talents and everything that God has built inside of you and given you at the moment of salvation, at your vocation, right? Everything he's given you now is to be used to supply for the body of Christ. And when everybody is working together, it's efficient. You own, you take ownership of who you are in Christ, and then you work together efficiently with the body of Christ to be able to accomplish the mission of Christ. Amen? I mean, I, an illustration that God brought to mind was just recently the youth were out here in our parking lot, 
and all that black mulch that was put out, right? There were piles of mulch everywhere. Now, Josh and the leadership team even could have come out and done this all on their own, and they would have gotten it. Even, even if Josh just did it by himself, he would have eventually finished. But you know what he did that day? He had all the youth come, as many as could come, and they all got out there. They got dirty. They spread that mulch, and what would maybe be a weak job took one day. Now, there were a couple things that, that Josh was trying to instill in these youth. One is ownership, and two is teamwork. See, he's trying to instill in these youth that this is your body. This is your family. Take ownership of it. Take responsibility. Oh, but you can't do it by yourself. Let's do it together as a team. Go over to, with, uh, to John chapter 10. I want you to look at the, There's a great biblical illustration of this ownership piece. <clears throat> and those who do not take ownership. Now keep your hand back in Acts, because that's where we're going to end up. But in John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus says, I am the shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Amen to that. Now look at 12. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and he leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known of mine. See, right here you have a God, Jesus Christ, our Lord, the God, who's taken ownership. He says, I am the shepherd. But there are some out here we call hirelings that are in it for the wrong reasons. Here they're in it for finances. But here in the church it could be many other reasons. And if you don't take ownership of it and look at this as being our home, our place, when something bad happens, when, when someone's offended or something is said or there's an attack, they're out of here because this was never mine in the first place, you see. Problem is, is within the church today, there's too many hirelings and not enough owners. We have to be an owner of what God has given us. We have to be an owner. We have to be the shepherd. We all shepherd something. We've got to take ownership of it and not give up on it. Don't be a hireling. Be here for the right reasons to fulfill God's mission. See, Paul was not scared to claim his ownership. Romans 2.16 says this, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Romans 16.25 says, Now to him that is a power to establish, establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. See, twice he uses my. But wait a second, Paul. You didn't shed your blood for the sins of this world. How, how dare you? You're arrogant. See, he's not arrogant. What he's done is he's taken ownership of something that changed his life. He sees the value of salvation and what it did for him. And he sees the value of what it can do in the life of other people. And because he made it his own, he was going to give it 100%. See, when you make something your own, you give it 100%. You're not that hireling. We have to be willing to take ownership, but then realize that we can't do it on our own. And to fulfill what we call mission and missions around the world, it takes teamwork. You know, um, I shared this with you when I first came back, and God has had me add to it a little bit. But I love what Pastor Samuel Bonda said in Zambia. He was a student while I was there. Now he's pastoring a church. In, uh, there in, in, I believe it's in Luancha area by Kufulufuta. But here's what he said. He said, you know, Bobby, he carried the vision over here. He said, Randy um, Foster and Kevin Petsky, they continued the vision here at Kufulufuta. John Sarah, he was there and he pushed it. He didn't stop. He said, Brian and Tammy, they accomplished the vision at Kufulufuta. But now Alex and Crystal Chippy and Pastor Pule, they renewed the vision See, there's this whole teamwork taking place for the past 30 plus years. And I guarantee you, everybody that was over there took ownership of this ministry. But they knew they could not do it themselves. They needed brothers and sisters to come alongside them. Even small um, mission teams came over, you know, here and there for a week or two. They made just as much a difference as the long-term missionaries in the lives of these nationals, the lives of these Zambians. See, it was time for the nationals to move forward in this vision. And let me tell you, they now are walking worthy. They are, they are moving forward in this progression of godliness in order to see God's word multiply and grow. 
They're a living example of what it means to live out this vocation. Amen? And we can reproduce that here. The same thing is, is happening here that is happening there. You know, it was more difficult for Tammy and I to come back than it was for us to go over. It really was. And it's still difficult to this day. Time goes by. Time heals all wounds, which is true. Um, but God finished with us over there. We fulfilled what God called us to do. Just as Barnabas, just as, as uh, Saul fulfilled their ministry there at Jerusalem, God brought them back. And see, we wanted to stay in Zambia. We really did. We wanted to stay. And it was good that we wanted to stay, but it wasn't right. Because, see, God had this plan of mission and missions for the nationals to continue the work. So our job is just to help them. And when we were finished, God brought us back. See, not all good things are right. I hope you understand that. You can't force that which is not right, even though it's good and it's difficult. So it's not easy for us being back here, but it's a wonderful opportunity because now we get to take what we learned over there and, start, and continue to do it here. Remember that constant mission. It's not been broken yet, and it's not going to be broken if we stay maintained in what God has called us to do. So the point of application here is this. Ownership is pointless without teamwork. Ownership is pointless without teamwork. Because, see, without teamwork with the Lord or the body of Christ, you'll find yourself in a place of pride and arrogancy. That's where you'll find yourself. That's where I'll find myself. See, it's good to be owner of what God's given you, but you have to understand it takes team to fulfill it. I think you've probably heard me say this quote, um, but I'll say it again because I like it so much. It's by Ronald Reagan. It says, there is no limit to the amount of good you can do when you don't care who gets the credit. See, that's how the body of Christ, who cares who gets the credit? Because you're not going to get it anyway. Jesus Christ is going to get it at the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, the, uh, uh, judgment seat of Christ. That's where he's going to receive the credit. So let us put down our pride and, and our arrogancy and understand, yes, take ownership, but work together as a team in this mission. Walk worthy. That godly progression is only going to happen if we take ownership and teamwork with others. Amen? And then uh, this last point here. This constant will not be broken if we walk worthy with biblical influence. Now, this one here is directed not just to the leadership, but it's also directed to the body of Christ. Because influence is connected to identification and DNA. I'm talking about spiritual DNA. That spiritual DNA. Look at Acts 12.25 should be up there. It says, took with them John. You see, John Mark got saved sometime. And while they were there in Jerusalem, they recognized there was something different about this guy. There was something different about him. And they saw that he was committed. They saw that he was willing, and so they took him with them. And I guarantee you they started pouring their spiritual DNA into the life of John. Identification of the committed is what the mission is about. That's one aspect of the mission. Identifying those and then pouring your life into them. Your specific work may be fulfilled at times, but the DNA of that work continues. Our work is finished over there when it comes to directly being there, but Tammy's and my DNA is still going on. Bobby's DNA is still going on. John Sayre's DNA, it's still going on. And it's a biblical constant. It's not going to be broken. We have to make sure that we are finding those that are committed and then pouring our lives into them. Saul and Barnabas identified those were committed and they invested. Now, when you look at this with, when it comes to Mark, we know how the story ends, okay? And uh, we're not going to go look at the passage. But over in Acts 15, 38, they're getting ready. Paul and Barnabas are getting ready to go on their second mission trip, right? So let me give you some backstory. At the end, or when they went on their first mission trip, they took Mark with them. But something happened. Mark got scared. Uh, we don't know exactly. But he left the mission team and he went back to Antioch. He gave up and left. See, and that left a bad taste in Paul's mouth. Because when you get over to Acts chapter 15, they're getting ready to go on their second mission trip. And Barnabas wants to take Mark. Now, some of it might be because Mark was Barnabas' nephew. So I'm sure there is that, that family connection there. But Barnabas wanted to take Mark with him, and, and Paul said, absolutely not. He left us in Pamphylia. We're, we're not going to take him with us. And it says that there was contention between them, right? 
Well, Proverbs 13.10 says, only by pride cometh contention. So there was some pride going on between Barnabas and Saul at this point and Paul at this point. And so what did they end up doing? They ended up dividing. There was division because of this pride. And so Barnabas takes Mark and they go one direction. And then um, Paul takes Silas and they go a different direction. And Paul and Silas, they are confirmed by the church. Now, we don't hear about Paul again, but we do hear about Mark. Mark wrote the book. Mark, right? So God used him in a mighty way. But what happens is a beautiful thing here is that in 2 Timothy 4.11, when Paul's getting ready to become a martyr, he's writing to Timothy and he says, you know what, bring Mark with you because he's profitable for the ministry. He's profitable. See, Paul was ready to just push him off because of this mistake and this poor choice he made. Oftentimes we title people through experience rather than the eyes of God. Because of one experience we've had with him, one poor choice, we title them, we mark them, and we walk away to find somebody else. So we can't do that. Because what we learn here through Mark's life is he was still committed. He was still worth pouring your life into. He just made a poor choice. You know, this happened to me over in Zambia. We had a man by the name of, of Fortson Kapupa. And uh, he was a pastor of Antioch Bible Baptist Church. He had already transferred his DNA to somebody else to take over the church. And he came to me and he said, you know, I really feel like God is calling me to help you with discipleship, to be that director of discipleship. And we prayed about it and God confirmed, yeah. So he comes alongside me. I start pouring my spiritual DNA into him and he's doing the same to me. We're working together as a team. And, and I train him up in the discipleship that we have had. And he understands that he's learning it. And we got to the point where we were going to different districts sharing discipleship. Well, it also led to the point to where I was sending him to do that without me being there because he is now the director. Well, he made a poor decision one day. He ended up pocketing some of the finances that I sent him with. And it, word got back to me, and it broke my heart. It really did. And uh, so I had to remove him from that position. And word travels fast in Zambia, does it not? And everybody knew what had happened. And man, I love the man. He's a good friend. Uh, there was brokenness, but there was no hard feelings. But I don't think I quite forgave him like I thought I did. So two years goes by. He moves away. He, um, he, I didn't know this until later, but emotionally he was so distraught he ended up in a hospital for some time. But through all that experience, he learned what true restoration was, re being restored back to his fellowship with God. And so he was no longer... Uh, a leader in the church. He was living out in the bush. He, was, he figured out a way to make charcoal to provide for his family. Two years have gone by. And so our executive board, we get together, and they start talking and saying, hey, what do you think about bringing um, Kapupa back? Put him as, as, in ministry. And I was like, no, it's not going to happen. I, I was like, no, absolutely not. I was being a Paul. I was like, nope. I, I love him. I just can't trust him. Right? And trust is an important thing to have. I understand. See, God was working. I didn't even realize it. So we get back together again, and they bring up Kapupa. Hey, maybe it's time we bring him back. I'm like, no, I don't want to just put him into a position. Maybe it's somebody else who needs to be that position, even if he's restored. But I realized something shortly after that, that I had never really forgiven him for what he had done. And I, was, I titled him, and I wasn't going to allow him to break away from this title. But I realized after hearing from his life how faithful he was to the Lord. And you know what I realized, you know what, he needs to be restored. So before we came back, I brought him back into the, to the office. We sat him down. I wish I had time to share with you everything that he went through, but I don't. And, and so we sat him down and I said, you know, we would love for you to come back and be part director of discipleship. And he was so excited. Um, he was so excited because it was such a great testimony to his family and to all those that were around, sharing with everybody what true biblical restoration is. And then he, so he ended up moving back to the mission. He is now director of discipleship, and he's also helping lead North Star Bible Institute right now. So what would have happened if I said, no, absolutely not, you see? See, here's a man who was truly committed, but he made a poor decision. And now, after the Spirit of God revealed it, we realize, you know, it's time to continue to pour into him. Now he is over there taking ownership of his responsibility, and he's transferring his DNA into the lives of other people. It's a beautiful thing. 
You know, Pule, we know that Pule, God showed us that Pastor Pule was the one to take over the ministry. You know whose DNA he has? He has Bobby Bonners, John Saris, Kevin Peskies, Randy Fosters, myself, so many other missionaries that's come. That DNA is flowing in and through him. And God showed us that he was the man, but God, he just had to see it himself. And now he's leading, he's, uh, um, leading this organization with this new, refreshed, refined vision. It's a beautiful thing. 2 Timothy 2.2 says the same, uh, commit thou unto faithful men. We talked about commit, but now it says faithful Faithful are those who are walking worthy, walking worthy in that godly way unto the Lord within the salvation that God has given. And when you recognize those people, you want to pour your life into them. See, our job is to minister to all, but invest in the faithful. Are you faithful? If so, we want to invest into you. We want you to grow and we want you to see what God, how God wants to use you in this mission. But if you're not faithful, there's no obligation for leadership to pour their life into you. Minister to all, invest in the faithful. So here's our final point of application. Identification is pointless without DNA transfer. Without that transfer, you can identify all day long, but if you're not willing to get involved with, with the lives of other people, what's it matter? You can identify them. The same goes for us leaders. If we identify people and we don't try to push and prod you to a place where God has called you, and then we're not willing to invest our DNA into you. Wow. See, it's pointless. Identification is pointless without DNA transfer. So this efficiency, effectiveness, all of this is important to the mission. So what type of effectiveness do you and I have in the mission? Are you prepared? Are you preparing? There's many opportunities. A18BI is getting ready to start. Opportunity to prepare. Are you going to be obedient with that preparation? What type of efficiency do we have in the mission? And that efficiency, have you taken ownership of the mission? Have you, are you working with a team to be able to accomplish the mission? What type of influence? Do you have influence in the life of other people? Are you making a difference in the life of identifying and pouring your life into the other people? We're going to end in Acts chapter 13, if you're right there. But I want you to look at this here. Walking worthy must be biblical constant in the call of to missions. It should not stop with us. Don't be the one that stops progress. Because one thing I've learned, if you stop progress, that means you're not teachable. And if you're not teachable, you're replaceable. God will find somebody who's willing to do what we are not to do. Go to Acts 13, 1 through 4. We're going to read this because I want you to see this biblical constant of missions. It says here, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, that was, also, was called Niger, and Lucius and Cyrene and Manaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, as they ministered to the Lord, as they ministered, that means they were involved in their church. And as they fasted, that means they were seeking spiritual things from God. The Holy Ghost said, separate me and Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto have called them. Then they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them. They sent them away. See, there's a biblical constant right here. They went, um, Barnabas went from Jerusalem to Antioch, from Antioch back to Jerusalem, back to Antioch, and now into all the world. And we have scripture in front of us because this constant did not fail. Mission did not fail. They were, where we're ministering within the church. They were fasting. They were doing everything they had. And when it came time to go, they went because they were prepared and ready to go. Are we ready to go? Are we going to fulfill this constant? Are we going to let it break down at our feet? Or are we going to continue as a team to move forward so that we might see our city changed? We might see this state changed. We might see this nation changed all the way beyond around the world. That's the mission that we've been called to. Let's pray. Father God, thank you again for this time. Thank you for the opportunity that you have given us to look in your scriptures and see how you work through the life of Paul and Barnabas. Lord, you've given us so much today. Lord, we have a lot to think about. And I ask and pray that if there's someone here that doesn't know Jesus, they would understand they have to meet you at the cross. Once they meet you there and enter into salvation, then they can walk in that godliness to be able to fulfill the great commission. For the church, Lord God, there are people here, I have no doubt, that you are pricking their heart for preparation, whether it would be to be able to share the gospel or whether it would be to go around the world. 
Maybe it's even to plant a church. I don't know. But Lord, you know who you've called. You know what you are doing. Lord, we will just pray and trust. Thank you for this opportunity. May you be honored and glorified. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.